Hi, and welcome to this part one of our fifth video lesson for beginner machinists. And today's lesson is going to be about bench work. Bench work these days is often overlooked because in a manufacturing setting, well, we want to get rid of manual or bench work as much as possible. And a good example of that is those ugly little rubber seams that they put on the sides of the roof of the car. Way back when, cars used to have seams that were hand finished before painted. Nowadays, the seam is hidden in that trough and that ugly little piece of rubber that we're all used to seeing now, well, just hides the shoddy workmanship. But for the home machinist, bench work can make all the difference between something that looks professional and something that looks homemade. My go-to project for all the years that I taught basic machine shop, well, it has always been for uh, bench work, the drill point gauge project. Now, we have those videos already and they demonstrate a lot of the techniques that you need for basic bench work. That's the drill point gauge part one, two, and three. And there's also a little quickie video about how to produce the scale on that project, the graduated scale. And I'll put links to those videos at the end of this one. And that means that with this lesson five, we're going to be putting the beginner back into uh, machine shop lessons for beginners. Uh, because we aren't going to be doing any projects. That's all covered with our practical videos. Uh, we're going to be looking at the basic tools used for bench work and explaining how they work and how to use them. And for that, let's talk about the first tool required for bench work that often isn't regarded as being a tool, and that is the bench itself. If you're going to properly finish and produce parts by bench work, well, you're going to need a very sturdy and rigid bench to work on. Now, we're going to be filing, we're going to be drilling, we're going to be sawing, and we're going to be doing tapping, threading, all kinds of operations. If we have a bench that moves around, that shakes, that isn't stable, well, it is going to be very difficult to perform any of those operations properly. So, first things first, find yourself a rigid and a strong bench to work on. Here's a little tip. If you have a rigid bench and it's not bolted to the ground, so it can pivot or move around a little bit, well, if you have a lower shelf, install very heavy things on that shelf to weight down the bottom of the workbench and that will stabilize it so that you'll be able to work a lot more accurately. Now a vise is important for bench work but there's a lot of type of vices so let's take a quick look at what I have kicking around in this little home shop of mine. And here let's start with this one. I have this precision toolmaker's vise and it's a very nice vise and it's often used for grinding operations or for compound angle operation because it's small enough to be able to be held in a milling machine vise at an angle and since this is quite accurate well it's really nice to do that type of work now this isn't something that you'd have in every shop it's really for precision work uh, it's also a precision vise because it's movable jaw is tightened down at an angle and that means that it pulls the jaw down as it pulls it forward and that means that the part that's held in it isn't lifted up by the jaw movement and that makes it quite accurate as well. Now we have two examples here of drill press vices. Now this one is really a combination drill press or very light mill work okay but this is definitely a drill press vice. It's shallow, it's wide based because drill press vices are deposited on the work table, they're not usually bolted down. So we want something very stable, and this is definitely stable. And we want, in this case, it to be in cast iron. A lot of vices, like this precision one, are hardened steel. But this one is cast iron, and it's important that it is, for two reasons. 
The first is that this is deposited and it slides around on the work table. And cast iron, grey cast iron, contains a lot of free carbon in it, okay, excessive carbon amounts, and that acts as a natural lubricant, okay, so it helps the uh, vice slide around on the drill press table uh, with a minimum of damage. But we also want it to be in cast iron because these vices have to be cheap. They're abused and sadly oftentimes they end up falling on the ground because there's so much manipulation involved in using them. And obviously they break and, and get distorted. So we don't want to pay a lot of money for them. So cast iron is good for that as well. Now this one is on the cheap side of the vices because it also is in cast iron. But it could be fixed to the table. It can be used for milling. And in this case it's for angular cuts because we can adjust it to different angles. So that's pretty practical to have in a home shop. Now, if we take a walk over to our milling machine, here we have our basic milling machine vise. It is sturdy. It is made of forged steel with hardened jaws. And this is made to last. But be careful. It is massive and it is strong but it is also a precision instrument. Of all the vices that we've seen, except for the precision machinist vice, well, this is the most accurate. It's way more accurate than a bench vice, obviously, and it's a lot more accurate than a drill press vice. But it is delicate in that it is very accurate. So we don't want to be hitting it with hammers or abusing it. We treat these massive vices like precision instruments. We treat them delicately. And now we're back to what really interests us for lesson five and that is the bench work because we're back to the bench vise. Now this is just a very small and inexpensive three inch vise. Well let's talk about vices a little bit for bench vices to see what's important. Now you want a drop forge vise if possible because obviously they're going to be a lot more uh, rigid and strong and that's important for a vise but they are a lot more expensive. Now drop forge is important. You also want jaws that are removable because they can be damaged and if they are well you'll want to replace them but not just removable if you can find jaws that are removable and reversible because oftentimes you'll have a textured side on the jaw and a smooth side and obviously one or the other depending on the type of part you're working on can do your thing. The textured side will grip more positively on the softer materials but will damage the surface finish whereas the soft side or the, the, the smooth side I should say well obviously wouldn't mar the part as much. Uh, it is not an anvil, however. Uh, be careful. A lot of people use machine uh, bench vices as anvils, and that shouldn't happen. Okay, if you need to use an anvil, go get yourself an anvil. Okay, now this one doesn't have it because it's just a home shop vice, but you do have vices that have quick releases so that you can open and close the vise quite quick, quickly. And here's an example of that from the school that I used to work at. Now those quick release vices are very nice because you can open and close them quickly without spinning the handle 20 times. But they are deadly on fingers because someone will take apart, put it in the vise and close the vise quickly and not remembering that the thumb is in the way and it's just very painful. I've seen it happen so many times. So if you do get a quick release vise, well good for you because they're quite nice to have but be very careful when you're using it. When you close it up don't put your part in there with your finger in the way. It's deadly stuff. And obviously for work that needs to be protected we can use soft jaws and that can be as simple as just a plate of aluminum bent up that you can fit over your jaws to protect the part, you know, a softer material. 
You have to remember that a good bench vice is very important for proper bench work because most bench work operations, we're talking about uh, hack sawing, we're talking about filing, we're talking about tapping, need to be performed if they are to be performed properly with two hands. And obviously you can't hold your part and tap it with two hands at the same time. And that bench voice becomes that stable and strong third hand. Now, a bench vice has to be mounted to your bench, but it has to be mounted very, very rigidly. So use a bottom plate or large washers if you're mounting it on a wooden desk top or bench top to make sure that your nuts don't eat into the wood eventually and loosen off the vise. Things have to be really rigid if you want to work accurately. And one last thing, when you mount your bench vise, mount it close to a corner and mount it in a way that the fixed jaw just ends up past the edge of the workbench. That's important because it will permit you to hold long parts. In some cases you could hold parts that go almost right to the ground without interfering with your, uh, your workbench and that's important for long parts and it's a nice way. All you have to do is mount it so that your fixed jaw is just a little proud of the edge of the vise. One last thing, if you can get a swivel base it's nice but it's not 100% necessarily because obviously when you're working on the bench you can move around a bit and if you mount your part or your tool close to the corner of the workbench well it gives you quite a bit of movement possible so that you can get two angles on parts without moving your bench vice. But if you can get a swivel base well that's nice to have. The next tools that we're going to want to take a look at well are our hammers and there are many many types. Here's the classic claw hammer and if you've ever done any construction well you know what this one's all about but it's not a shop hammer it's not something we use in the machine shop. A pollster's hammer now this is really cute and it's got a magnetized uh, tip on this end here for holding tacks uh, but but not a shop hammer. Here's a hammer that we can use in the shop and it's one of many many different shapes of sheet metal hammers uh, but this is more for sheet metal work and it's not a basic machine shop type of operation so we'll set that aside. Now what we're looking at are our three basic machine shop hammers and here they are. We have our ball peen hammer okay that comes in different sizes we have our positioning hammer very important if you want to do accurate work and we have a dead blow hammer be careful here this is not a mallet it is a hammer a dead blow hammer it contains a shot or very coarse sand to absorb part of the blow and uh, we can find these also as lead head hammers or very soft brass head hammers. Uh, they are made to absorb the shock. We'll talk about those a little later. So let's take a look at each one in more detail starting with our ball peen. The ball peen hammer is really our go-to hammer in the machine shop. It's our everyday workhorse hammer and it's used for all kinds of operations from uh, punching, center, prick, uh, letter punching, to chisel work, cold chisel work. It's also used for assembly and disassembly uh, and it can be used for peening because the ball peen has a slightly convex surface on one end, just very slightly convex, and a round or a ball shaped surface on the other. And these were used originally for operations of uh, upsetting rivets mostly and it was quite used at that time and the ball here was often used for peening operations. That means to surface treat a part by repeatedly ha hammering it 
with something that is very uh, smooth in surface and compressing a certain quantity of material and hardening it in a way, just a surface treatment type hardening. And now, now a lot of that isn't done anymore. By the way, you can see how they use these ball peen hammers for forming and, and peening uh, in a lot of brass work. And here's a part that's an example of brass work that's done by peening. Now, ball peen hammers today are our go-to hammers uh, and they come in different weights. Now, this is a larger model, but we can have something a little smaller or even smaller than that. And they do go right down to quite small. And why is that? Well, as we'll see eventually with our punches, like our letter punches, our center punches, our prick punches, uh, we choose the um, strength of the blow of our ball peen by its mass. So obviously if you want to hit something harder, you're going to use a more massive hammer. If you need a delicate strike, well, you're going to use a small one. Because as a general rule, except for when we're using cold chisels, uh, ball peen hammers aren't swung. They are let to, to fall. They're left to fall on the part that we're trying to peen. Uh, we don't swing it as we would a claw hammer. Well, obviously, because when we strike a punch, we want to strike it head on. Because hard on hard, if we strike it at an angle, well, obviously that punch is going to take off. We'll look at that with uh, when we look at punching. But remember, for ball peens, the trick to hitting harder is to using bigger. Now, it's important that you maintain your ball peen hammers and that the surfaces remain free of mars or, or marks. Uh, you want them to be, to be nice, smooth and properly finished because obviously if they are marked or marred, they're going to transfer that to the part that you're striking. So really maintain them and they need to be refinished and polished regularly. Another thing, ball peen hammers are often abused and if you should notice that you're using a hammer and that the head is lightly loose on the handle or that the handle is cracked in any way, well do not use that hammer. Uh, repair it, uh, make it right and then use it. Very important for safety. The second type of hammer that we want to look at, well, are these positioning hammers. And the one we have here, well, is the one that we have in our beginner's lathe project, uh, hammer project. It's a little positioning hammer. They are light. They are delicate. They are not meant to hit with any type of force. They are positioning hammers. And we often see them come with uh, those hard, yellow plastic striking surfaces but they can be as is the case here brass uh, that can be used in this case i chose a half hard brass not a very soft brass and the second face here well is a hardened steel face uh, what are they used for well they're called positioning hammers so take a guess they're used to position parts and they're used to position parts with great accuracy and here's how they work. For this I'm going to make a little room here and install this massive piece of about a one inch thick a piece of stainless steel on my little poor man's surface plate here and I'm going to position it. Let's say I want to move this uh, massive steel plate one thousandths of an inch I could put a dial indicator on it and just come and very lightly tap it. If I wanted to line it up, I can very lightly tap it. Now why is that tapping action more accurate than just positioning it by pushing? Well, because my fingers are spongy. They are elastic up to a certain point. And if I want to move something by pushing on it, I'm going to apply force and my finger is going to deform okay because that's the way I am I'm a cushy guy so my finger is going to deform and I'm actually going to have to apply 
a lot more force than is required to get this thing going. Once it starts to move, less force is required to keep it going. So what do you think happens? When I move it, I invariably end up by moving it more than I wanted to. And that's just basic physics. However, if I use something that is hard enough to transfer energy rapidly and accurately without deformation, like my fingers did, with, well then I can transfer very efficiently that, that energy, and that means that I don't have to transfer a lot of it to get something valuable out of it, and that is movement. So in this case, if I put one finger here and just very so lightly tap the other end, I'm not damaging my part because this half hard brass surface is a lot softer than the stainless, but I can feel with my finger here that even the slightest little blow here is moving this plate ever so slightly, and that permits an accurate positioning. So positioning hammers, really important hammers to have for work in the machine shop. Now let's take a look at our dead blow hammers. Now these do exactly the contrary of what our positioning hammer did. They stretch the blow out in time. Instead of transferring the energy crisply, they, they transfer it over a certain period. We're talking fractions of a second, but it's still stretched out over time. And how do they do that? Well, they do it with shot or sand in the head that's loose. You can hear it move around there. Now, that stretches the time of impact. And why is that important? Well, it's important because when movement meets immovable, well, you get rebound. And that means that if I took a 1 to 3 block and tried to sit it in the bottom of a vise by hitting it with a hard ball peen hammer, well, I would hit, move, bounce, and come back up. And this block would never sit properly in the bottom. Never. Not quite true. It would sit properly if I hit it with just enough force to hit it down, which is not easy to do. But this dead blow hammer stretches the time of impact. So my block is in the vise, I strike the vise. The shot is pushed to the back of the hammer on the blow. As it hits, it pushes the part down. I hit the bottom of the vise. The part wants to bounce back up. And what does it mean? It means a hammer that's not done pressing on the part yet because the shot is still in movement coming forward and compressing the dead blow hammer onto the part. And what does that do? Well, it stops the rebound and I end up with a part that's sitting in the bottom of a vise. And you know that that's important if you want to work accurately on a milling machine. So dead blow hammers are really important for working on uh, machines. Our three basic types of hammers. Now remember, the ball peen, you're going to need more than one weight. You want three or four, from quite small to quite large. Positioning hammer, well only one is really required. And your dead blow can be this shot type uh, rubber steel enforced dead blow, but it could also be a lead hammer. Just be careful, lead is a toxic material, so I prefer nowadays to be using these. Well, now that we've looked at hammers, it would be nice to have something to hit, so let's take a look at the most common types of punches that we use in the shop. Here we have our number and letter punches. Uh, we can see these being used on our one two three block project. Here we have a chisel edged punch. It's not a chisel, it's a chisel edged punch. And this one you can see being used in the drill point gauge project to produce the lines for the graduated scale. Here we have a center punch with its approximately 90 degree point. Here we have a prick punch with approximately a 60 degree point. Here we have a drift punch, and here we have a chisel. Now a chisel isn't a punch at all. And what I'm holding in my hand here, well this isn't a punch at all either, it's a scriber. Don't use it for punching. Let's start by looking at chisels. 
Now, chisels aren't punches, they're cutting tools, and they have a cutting edge. So, let's take a look at this one that's been ground up for cutting sheet metal. So, let's try and cut this thin piece of aluminum a sheet. So, we're going to install it in our vise. And using the chisel and a ball-peen hammer, we're going to cut it. Drift punches are flat-ended punches. And they don't punch at all as far as punching if you mean plastic deformation. No, they're really used for disassembly. These are the punches that are used for removing dowel pins. The next three punches are true punches. And by that I mean that they're used to deform metal. Now our first one up here is our prick punch and it has a 30 to 60 degree point. Its main purpose in life, and there's two, is to make small indentations in order to position the center punch with uh, greater accuracy. Now, that's all fine and dandy, but what would be the second application for a prick punch? Well, they're often used for permanent layouts, and that means that when we want to go over a layout line and produce a few small punch marks on it, so that it won't be erased by friction or other machining activities. Now, my center punch, however, is used to mark the center location of a hole that's to be drilled, and its main purpose is to guide a small drill to its proper position. And this chisel edge punch here, well, is used to mark short lines, usually scales or graduated scales. And we can see these three punches being used in our drill point gauge project. So I don't want to dwell on it, but uh, it is important to understand that this acute prick punch, okay, it's not acute prick punch, it's an acute prick punch because the angle is 30 to 60 degrees on the point, is a lot easier to position on a scribed line intersection, okay, for marking, let's say, the position of a hole. Then it is easy to position this center punch, which is a lot more obtuse, around 90 degrees, okay. So we use them in combination. So when we are marking holes, we use the prick punch to get the precision and the center punch to open up that mark. And why is it more accurate? Well, because it has a thinner point. We can deposit it on the intersection sideways and then pivot it upwards and get a really good accurate positioning and see what we're doing. Something that's difficult to do with a 90 degree center punch. So let's take a look. And finally, our numbers and letter punches. Well, not much to say about these except that you got to get used to holding them upside down. Hey, they are mirror imaged, so uh, it's something to get used to. And you can see them being used in the 123 block video. I think it's the second video, the part two, where I identify the block, and you can see the technique of punching once, filing down the mushrooming caused by the punching of the letter, and then re-punching to get really a good depth of penetration on your letter and a nice crisp letter once you finish it that second time. So, one last thing about punches before we move on, and that is mushrooming or deformation of the tang or the end that is struck by the hammer. Now, this is quite dangerous. If there is deformation, head over to the pedestal grinder, grind it off, fix it up, keep that tip nice, okay? It has to be sharp for the cutting, fine, or deformation, but the 
side that you hit, don't let it deform too much because pieces can flake off and that can become a real problem. Also, especially when you're using the cold chisels, a thick uh, padded leather glove is highly recommended and obviously not on the hand that you're swinging with. Or, and a protective uh, sleeve that fits over your chisels, well that's a real good idea also. Because in this game, a swing and a miss can mean a trip to the hospital. So that should bring us to somewhere around a half an hour and I think that's enough for this video. But I did say earlier on that I would give you some links because what we're starting to see here, well, has a lot to do with our practical videos and if you want the theory classes to make sense, well you have to look at those practical videos. And I think that now would be a really good time, seeing as we're into the bench work, uh, to look at the part one of our drill point gauge project. Uh, it's a long video, but, but it's, it's interesting and it's all about the tools that we've been looking at today. So here's a link to that up at the top here. I'll give you a second link here, and, and that second link has to do with producing the scale. It's a little quickie video where I showed how to produce the scale with a punch, uh, a chisel edged punch, uh, on the drill point gauge project. So here's a little quickie to that video. And a third little quickie here, the one down at the bottom, uh, and it's going to take you to the part of the second one, two, three block video where I show the number punching operation. And that's interesting to see, but, but we don't want to see that whole video, not right now, anyhow. Uh, so this link will take you straight to the part where the punching is taking place. So that's enough for this week. Uh, and I'd like to just say thanks for watching. Now, next video, I'm hoping next week because I'm going to get a tooth taken out and I'll see how I'm feeling. It could uh, put me out of commission for a few days, so we'll see how things go. But uh, if all is well, I should have the next video in about a week from now. I'm not very quick at doing all this. Uh, and the next video will be the part two of our fifth lesson on uh, bench work. And we're going to be looking at, well, filing and files and uh, hacksawing and hacksaw blades and taps and dies. So until then, have fun, be safe and happy machining. Now, I don't want to dwell on it, but I think it's important to make a point here that our uh, prick punch, get it, make a point, our prick punch and if this was a George Carlin seven words you can't say on TV uh, recording, well, we'd say something like, remember, you can prick your finger, but you can't finger your prick. Anyways, that's that was 30 years ago or something like that. So anyways, okay, let's stop. So I don't want to dwell on it, but uh, it is important.